Good afternoon, Blazer fans, and welcome to this edition of the Blazer's Edge videocast. I'm Dave Deckard from blazersedge.com. Behind the camera with me, as always, is the brain plus our crack Blazer's Edge video staff here to answer your mailbag questions about the Portland Trail Blazers. Let's dive right into it. We're going to take a question from Arlen, and it says, Dave, you keep talking about the Blazers using their draft picks, but the team has said that they prefer to get help right now and trade for a player who's already in the league. What's up with that? Well, Arlen, you caught me. I believe the Blazers are speaking the truth. I think they'd prefer exactly that, to get an all-star quality player right now to reload instead of rebuild, as the saying goes. The problem I have is, I don't think that's going to work. If they're going to really help this team, they desperately need help in the backcourt. And backcourt players are at a premium now, especially at the point guard position that they covet. There are a few different stripes of point guards out there. There's the entire group of people who wouldn't help the Blazers enough to make a difference, so they can't trade for. There are all-star level players who are too old for them to practically trade for, especially with draft picks. And then there are players they'd love to have who aren't available. That just leaves a few players left in the league. You have Darren Williams. He's the obvious choice. He is a free agent, and unless you can work out some kind of sign and trade with New Jersey, uh, you're going to have to convince him to just sign for your cash. So he's not a factor in the trading of the draft picks. You've got three other names that jump to mind immediately. You have Tony Parker in San Antonio if they want to rebuild. You've got Rajon Rondo in Boston because they want to rebuild. And you might look at a Kyle Lowry in Houston if Houston would be willing to take those draft picks. Either way, I think it's a long shot that the Blazers get any of those players. You have to have willing teams, you have to have the right trade, and you have to have some desire of those players to play in Portland. Their best shot is probably going for Williams, but then you have to ask how much money is that going to cost, and how much more will you be able to improve the team after that. Certainly you're not going to be able to get a name level or all-star shooting guard alongside him if you're playing Darren Williams $17 million a year. So you're looking at spending all your assets to get a guy who's going to take up most of your cap space and probably doesn't propel you to the elite level in the West. Now, if you talk about getting a shooting guard, I'm going to name the top seven for you in terms of points produced. You have Kobe Bryant. He's not available. You have Dwayne Wade. He's not available. You have Monte Ellis. He might be available, but barely. You have Joe Johnson. He's too old and too expensive. DeMar DeRozan. Now you're starting to get into borderline players. You have James Harden. He's not available. And the seventh is Nick Young. And you can see how quickly we descended there down the ladder. You could look at a guy like Andre Iguodala, but again, he costs a fortune. If you get him alone, does he revolutionize this team? I don't think so. You could start speculating pie in the sky about getting a guy like Williams and Iguodala, but then what do you do with Nicholas Batum? You have to have money to sign him. Any way you slice it, the prospect of getting two name-level backcourt players and retaining Nicholas Batum, which is about the only solution that makes the Blazers clearly have a shot at the elite, the chances of that are minuscule. What do the Blazers have to do if they really want to rebuild? They have to take a longer-term perspective. So what if it's a guard week draft? If you don't find the back card court player that you want, you draft forwards and you raise them up now. You keep your costs low next year, and then you look to trade either some of those young forwards or more likely LaMarcus Aldridge after a couple years because he will get you almost any guard you want when those new forwards grow up. The Blazers would love to reload instead of rebuild. I agree with that, but I don't think it's going to happen. The safe route is to take a two to three year perspective and rebuild that way. Question number two comes from Mark. He says, Dave, the Blazers' three-point shooting has increased exponentially since the coaching change. Explanation, please. Okay, well, this is not too difficult. Under Caleb Canales, the Blazers guards have a much bigger green light than they did under Nate McMillan. The chance to shoot more has bred confidence and given them a rhythm, so they're hitting more shots. 
also you can't discount the importance of their physical form. Before the coaching change, you could count the number of shots that Wesley Matthews shot straight on about two fingers, and Raymond Felton looked like he was shot putting every three-pointer he took. All of a sudden, after the coaching change, both of them have rediscovered good form. Were they coached into it? Perhaps. Did they suddenly magically remember it? Perhaps. The other factor you have to consider is that both of them like to shoot off the dribble. They like to handle the ball a little bit. Under McMillan, the offense was keying off of LaMarcus Aldridge so hard that they weren't taking their three-pointers in stride. They had to catch and shoot them. Now, with more freedom to dribble, they feel better with their shot, and so the shots are going in. Now, all of that said, here's my question back to you. Has any of this freedom or the increased three-point shooting by the guards led to more wins or even more points for the Blazers? They're winning at about the same 500-ish level that they were before the court coaching change. They've topped 100 points in only three of 14 games since Caleb Canales became coach. That's about a one in five ratio. Under Nate McMillan, they did it 15 times in 43 games, which is about a one in three ratio. Looser guard play and more three-point shots going in has not necessarily led to more wins or even more points for the Blazers. So you have to take the seemingly better offense with a grain of salt. It's possible that the guards are playing better now, certainly. But it's also possible that Coach McMillan knew what he was doing when he made this a LaMarcus Aldridge-centered offense. Question number three. Dave, Raymond Felton is playing like a champ lately. Is this improvement mostly because Nate McMillan's gone, so why play bad anymore? Or conditioning has finally gotten him into game shape? Or he wants more money from the Blazers next season? Or he wants more money from someone else next season? Everybody is chanting to let him go, but if he keeps averaging a near triple-double and playing as well as he has been, should the Blazers really be so quick to get rid of him? Signed, Alex. Well, we've talked about this a little bit before on the video cast, Alex. Uh, the attitude is certainly concern, but there's more to it than that. First of all, to answer the first part of your question, all of the above are true. The coaching change has loosened up Felton's game. Uh, I think he's in better shape than he was at the start of the season, and he's certainly eyeing that next contract from the Blazers or from someone else. You have to be a little concerned what the start of next year or any year is going to look like with this guy, given that the circumstances won't be the same once he's used to his coach and once he's been paid. But also, I think you have to look at the same question we looked at at the, at the end of the last question. Is this really making the Blazers that much better? The whole here is not necessarily more than the sum of its parts, which is one of the signs that you've got a truly great point guard. Felton doing better and scoring 30 usually leads to a Portland win, but it doesn't necessarily lead to other Portland players doing better, nor does it give you inspired confidence in the team. In fact, you pretty much know that the next game, Felton and his guard co cohorts are going to play poorly again, and the Blazers are going to lose. There's no chemistry there. There's no cooperation there. You get some assists on a good night. I'm not saying that he doesn't. He sure does. But that doesn't necessarily lead to other players having inspired games. In fact, the whole production is kind of random at this point. So. Even under the best of circumstances, I don't think Felton is fulfilling the ideal at point guard, and I don't think he's the right point guard for Portland, even if he's a pretty good point guard overall. Our next question comes from Jim. It says, Dave, the Blazers have run through Raymond Felton and Andre Miller at point guard in the last couple years. The only guy who's stuck around here for any appreciable amount of time has been Steve Blake. What kind of point guard exactly do the Blazers need? Who are they going to keep? Well, the obvious one would be an all-star level point guard like Darren Williams, as we said earlier. But failing that, I got three words for you. Catch and shoot. And to understand the importance of that, let's throw it over to the high-tech Blazer's Edge court. Here we are once again at the high-tech Blazer's Edge videocast demonstration court. Now you'll notice this week that we sprang extra for a key. If the stock options go right, in a couple weeks we'll be able to afford the grounds crew to paint it.
Until then, we've set up this tableau just as it was in the second quarter of the very first Portland-Milwaukee game, the one in which the Blazers got hammered at home, to demonstrate the importance of the catch and shoot to Portland's offense. You notice that starting out, we have our point guard Raymond Felton with the ball up top. LaMarcus Aldridge is in the post, extended from the elbow with a single defender. And all three other offensive players have cleared out to the weak side of the court in order to leave these two alone with the play, drawing their defenders with them. Now Felton enters the ball to LaMarcus Aldridge causing his defender, Brandon Jennings, to make a decision common for Portland's opponents this year, whether or not to double Aldridge. Now, the Bucks and Jennings being no fools, they decide that Aldridge in the post is a bigger threat than Felton on the outside. So Jennings goes down to double team. Now, originally in this play, these two players were too close together, which would allow the defender to get back if a pass were made out. So, Portland and Felton decide to go over here in order to create more space. Now he's made his defender make a legitimate decision. Stay with Aldridge or come back to Felton. Jennings decides to stay with LaMarcus Aldridge because obviously he's the greater threat, as most Portland defenders do. Now the Blazers have a question facing them. What do they do in this situation? The only clear shot that Aldridge can get against a hard double team is some kind of random fadeaway, uh, which is from distance and difficult to get off in any case and is probably going to miss. What are the alternatives? Normally, you'd like to see some kind of cut from the weak side. Notice, though, what Milwaukee's defenders have done. They're shading toward the paint. Not one of them is more than two inches away from the edge of the key. That makes it very difficult for any weak side offensive players to get through in order to receive a pass without being defended. Now, if they were concerned at all about Felton, this wouldn't be such a problem because someone would have to shade over here, leaving holes through which a cutter could cut. That is not happening here. Another option would be Felton himself cutting down the lane and Aldridge zipping a quick pass in. However, their proximity to the key again disallows that. As soon as he begins to cut, one, two, or three are going to come over to disrupt the pass and or the shot if he should catch it. So the problem is the only option left for Portland at this point is for Aldridge to bail out with a pass over here to Felton. Now, Felton has just as few options as Aldridge did. He cannot drive because he'll be picked up immediately. Any pass over here is simply going to be covered. Literally, the only option left for him is to shoot. So he receives the ball, what we call the catch, obviously, and he puts it up from distance, which is the shooting part of the catch and shoot. And of course, being Raymond Felton, he misses quite badly. Now, on this particular play, the Blazers got bailed out, Nicholas Batum got a good offensive rebound, and they scored. But in most cases, what's going to happen with this missed shot is you've got five defenders near the lane, five offensive players outside. They're just going to grab that ball and run it back on the Blazers. Now, if Portland had a point guard that was good at the catch and shoot, first of all, this defender would not be able to double team so easily. Second of all, if he did, someone else would have to come over, freeing up these offensive players to do more damage. This is exactly why the catch and shoot proficiency is going to be one of the qualities the Blazers will need to look for in their future point guard. It's not just his scoring at stake, but making life easier for all of his teammates including and especially the main guy, LaMarcus Aldridge. Now let's take a look at the video of the actual play right now. Our final question of the day comes from James. It says, Dave, what are the chances of Caleb Canales being retained as the Blazers head coach next year? The team seems to be playing looser and with more effort. It's a great start. Well, I, I kind of agree with you. And actually, 
I hope Caleb Canales goes on to a long and successful coaching career. I think he's a great guy. I think the team has already told you how much work he's put in. I can't think of a person that I'd more like to have something good happen to in the whole NBA. But you've got to keep in mind a couple caveats to the situation. First, playing looser doesn't necessarily mean playing better or playing more sustainable basketball. Witness Kevin Pritchard subbing in for Mo Cheeks at the end of the 2004-2005 season. The team did start playing a lot looser. A couple players played remarkably better. Sebastian Telfair comes to mind. Ruben Patterson was another one. But that play didn't have any effect on the team's win total, didn't have any effect on those players' destiny ultimately, and didn't have much effect on the future of the team. Now, Caleb's future will depend on which road the Blazers take, I believe. I can see them retaining him if they decide to go with a near total rebuild. But even then, I have a hunch that they'll be keeping him to coach a few young guys and absorb some losses until they feel they can get really good, and then they will go after a bigger name coach. Now, if they get some all-star level players next year like they want, they'll go after the coach with a name to match right away. I'm not sure either scenario is really fair to Caleb, but I think that's the hard, cold reality of where the Blazers are this year and the way this league works. So I hope things work out for Caleb. I really do. I'm just sure, not sure that they're going to work out that well in the near term or in Portland. Thank you guys for all your questions. It's been a pleasure to be with you, and we're glad that you tuned in to see us. We will see you again next week. Until then, have a great time and go Blazers.